Nicola Stewart makes me laugh. She gives you instructions to make stuff. I'm waiting for her, for her to go one day. Today we're going to build a pyramid based on the ancient pyramid at Giza. She says things, doesn't she say, like, start with the directions where you go, well, I ain't making this. Like, okay, break out your chestnut roasting pants. Good morning. It is Tuesday, Ayn Rand Tuesday, July the 18th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the serenity prayer and the patriotic song of the day, we will have The Rape of the Mind, There's No Free Lunch, Alex Epstein, Laura Ingram, Rep. Matt Getz, Leo Terrell, Vivek Ramaswamy, Drug Cartels, and Ayn Rand's book, Philosophy, Who Needs It? Part 4 of Chapter 7. All that and more when I get back. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and remove your hands for the national anthem of the United States of America. Thank you, thank you. And now there's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths by David Bonson. Covetousness and Class Envy Despite those who equate free market economics with greed, the heyday of lazy fair economics in the 19th century also saw an unprecedented outpouring of private philanthropy. Moreover, the materialistic Americans are unique in the many academic, medical, and other institutions founded and sustained with private, voluntary contributions. Thomas Sowell. For the camp who advocates social justice via confiscation, this basic fact that Sowell affirms may not be sufficient. Nevertheless, one undeniable byproduct of the last 150 years of wealth creation via market forces has been a level of private, voluntary, and therefore charitable endeavors never before seen in human history. Were the charitable impulses new? Of course not. What was new was the wealth that free enterprise created, which was now available to fund such philanthropic passions. The farmer... And that was There's No Free Lunch by David Bunsen. Back in a minute. (laughs) 
Thank you, thank you. What are the true conservative suggested federal political priorities? Number one, recognize that the government has no rights. Two, defund Planned Parenthood. Three, replace the Affordable Care Act. Four, institute zero-based budgeting. Five, prohibit collective bargaining for all public employees. Six, assign criminal and civil liabilities to all government regulators. Seven, immediately repeal the Patriot Act. Eight, immediately repeal all emergency dictator laws. Nine, reinstate writs of outlawry. Ten, use taxpayer funds to sponsor recalls, ballot initiatives, and referendums. Eleven, create a flexible minimum wage. 12. Means test health care. 13. Immediately and permanently prohibit investment banking by any office holder. And 14. Make nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons obsolete. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now a little bit of Alex Epstein. And I just want to stress, because sometimes people will see this false stuff and they'll say, this is propaganda, this shouldn't be here, but it's it's the reverse of the truth, right? So the truth is human beings have made the planet a much better place. We've actually made it a greener place, which is part of it, and the CO2 has contributed, but the main thing is we've made it a livable place. You know, the planet is naturally resource poor and threat rich, right? And what we've done is we've made it high in resources and low in threats. It's just so much of a better environment for human beings to live and we should be celebrating that and that's that's the one thing that's that's distinctive about my approaches is there a lot of people that i like have books and articles and stuff you know saying look there's too much alarmism we shouldn't over prioritize this issue but i think the truth is even further than that it's actually that fossil fuels have made the world amazing and we need to celebrate them just as you would celebrate any drug whose benefits yeah. far far uh, outweighed its negative side effects, especially with fossil fuels. They have this special attribute where their benefits actually cure their side effects, which is not true of a drug. Like if a drug has adverse side effects, it's like you get the benefits, but then you have the side effects and you can try to do other stuff. But with fossil fuels, if they say cause 10% more drought, well, they give you an ability to totally neutralize that through irrigation and through other things, right? Or even if you take standard air pollution, which is now getting lower and lower with better technology, but like, let's say it caused, you know, a 0.1% incidence higher in a certain kind of cancer, but it also gives you a modern medical system that can detect that and cure that. So you're much healthier than you would be without the fossil fuels. So it's just, they're this, and that's why I love what, you know, your approach is you really have adopted this approach of like, it's wholesome. This is a good thing. We should be excited about it. And and the people thinking about it incorrectly, there's something really wrong with the thinking versus just, oh, they're in the right, they're, they're headed in the right direction or that their heart is in the right place, but they're just going a little overboard. It's like, no, no, they're they're thinking about it 180 degrees wrong. And and I just want to. And that was uh, Alex Epstein back in a minute. Thank you very much. And now, from uh, the Ingram angle, Laura Ingram. Joining me now, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, a member of the House Oversight Committee. Congresswoman, first, your reaction to the DOJ's target letter against President Trump. It's outrageous. I can't believe that this is going on. This has been happening for eight years to President Trump. And every single time, over and over, he's proven innocent. And the American people will not tolerate this. I mean, look at Jack Smith. He's such a lousy attorney. He's got overturned cases, mistrials, and and judicial rebukes. And he has his target set on President Trump. And it's all to basically change the 2024 election. Do you think it's election interference? I do. I absolutely do. It's the same thing we saw with the Hunter Biden laptop. They want to control the narrative in the news. And they believe if they can paint President Trump guilty of some kind of seditious conspiracy, they believe they can convince the American people that they can't elect President Trump and that they have to reelect Joe Biden. How significant is this problem of that entrenched bureaucracy of career civil servants working and burrowed in against any, I don't care if it's Trump or DeSantis or someone else, 
working against his or her agenda in the future. How, how, how critical is this, that this be finally tackled once and for all? It's the most dangerous thing happening in our country. Laura, I listened to everything you just laid out, and I want you to know it, it, it should be a lesson for every single person in Washington. Everything you said is exactly how people in my district feel at home. It's how the American people feel. They don't want the career uh, establishment Washington federal employees coming up with the policies and making the decisions on their behalf. They want the people they elect. They elected President Trump, and these career bureaucrats, the unelected bureaucrats, are the ones that stopped his agenda. And, and it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Well, so people I, feel like they have no voice. That's, this is a, anywhere you go. It does. It, people say it doesn't matter who you elect. You have no voice. No, you actually do have a voice. If we actually have a pared down bureaucracy, that is what the founders wanted. And they, they didn't want all this the cranes everywhere in Washington. Right? It's just cranes building out the bureaucracy. All right. Here's what the White House said today about our independent justice system. Watch this. The president respects the Department of Justice, their independence. Uh, he has been very, um, very steadfast on making sure that the rule of law comes back in this administration, comes back uh, in the White House and clearly the administration more broadly. And that's what you have seen. Your reaction, given what we know about the interference in the Hunter Biden's uh, uh case with what she just said we haven't seen the rule of law we've seen our borders ripped wide open we've seen our tax dollars sent over to another foreign war that people are not invested in we want peace we don't want another war uh, the biden administration is is lawless actually we've seen crime increase we've seen inflation at near 40 That's year just highs in the biden household Exactly, 100%. Let's talk about who the real criminals are. It's the Biden family. How did they get so rich? Uh, from, I'll tell you how. I'm on the oversight committee, and our investigation is incredible. We actually have bank records. We have SARS reports that show wire transfers coming in from foreign countries all over, directly into LLCs, and then paid out to Biden family member after family member. Imagine if that were Don Jr., right? But wire transfers, they'd be like, connect the dots, people. Yeah. And that was... Um, Rep, uh, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene being interviewed by Laura Ingram. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the rape of the mind. Needling for the truth. During the Second World War, the technique of the so-called truth serum, the popular name for narcoanalysis, was developed to help soldiers who had broken down under the strain of battle. Through narcoanalytics by means of injections and sedatives, they could be brought to remember and reveal the hyper-emotional and traumatic moments of their war experiences that had driven them into acute anxiety neurosis. Gradually, a useful mental first aid technique was developed which helped the unconscious to reveal its secrets while the patient was under the influence of the narcotic. How does the true serum work? The practice is simple. After an injection, the mind, in a kind of half-sleep, is unable to control its secrets, and it may let them slip from the hidden reservoirs of frustration and repression into the half-conscious mind. In certain acute anxiety cases, such enforced provocation may alleviate the anxieties and pressures that have led to breakdown. But narcoanalysis often does not work. Sometimes the patient's mind resists this chemical intrusion and enforced intervention, and such a situation often obstructs the way for deeper and more useful psychotherapy. The fear of unexpected mental intrusion and coercion may be pathological in character. When I first published my concept of menticide and brainwashing, I received dozens of letters and phone calls from people who were convinced that some outside person was trying to influence them and direct their thoughts. This form of mental intrusion delusion may be the early stage of a serious psychosis in which the victim has already regressed to primitive magic feelings. In this state, the whole outside world is seen and felt as participating in what is going on in the victim's mind. There is, as it were, no real awareness of the frontiers between I, the person, and the world. Such fear-ridden persons are in constant agony because they feel themselves the victims of many mysterious influences which they cannot check or cope with. They feel continually endangered. Psychologically, their fear of intrusion from the outside can be partially explained as a fear of the intrusion of their own fantasies from the inside, from the unconscious. They are frightened of their own hidden, unconscious thoughts, which they can no longer check. 
It would be a vast oversimplification to stick an easy psychiatric label on all such feelings of mental persecution, for there are many real, outside mental pressures in our world, and there are many perfectly normal people who are continually aware of and disturbed by the barrage of stimuli directed at their minds through propaganda, advertising, radio, television, the movies, the newspapers, all the gibbering maniacs whose voices never stop. These people suffer because a cold, mechanical, shouting world is knocking continually at the doors of their minds and disturbing their feelings of privacy and personal integrity. There is the further question of whether or not drugs used in the truth serum always produce the desired effect of compelling the patient to tell the inner truth. Experiments conducted at Yale University in 1951, J.M. McDonald, on nine persons who received intravenous injections of sodium amytal, the so-called truth serum, showed interesting results, tending to weaken our faith in this drug. Each of the patients, prior to the injection, had been suggested a false story related to a historical period about which he was going to be questioned. The experimenters knew both the true and the false story. Let me quote from the report. It is of interest that the three subjects diagnosed as normal maintain their suggested stories. Of the six subjects diagnosed as neurotic, two promptly revealed the true story, two made partial admissions consisting of a complex pattern of fantasy and truth, one communicated what most likely was a fantasy as truth, and the one obsessive-compulsive individual maintained his cover story except for one parapaxia, faulty or blundering action. In several cases, American law courts have refused to admit as evidence the results of true serum tests, largely on the basis of psychiatric conviction that the true serum treatment is misnamed, that, in fact, narcoanalysis is no guarantee of getting at the truth. It may even be used as a coercive threat in cases where victims are not aware of its limited action. Still, another danger more closely related to our subject is that a criminal investigator can induce and communicate his own thoughts and feelings to his victim. Thus, the true serum may cause the patient with a weak ego to yield to the interventionist's synthetically injected thoughts and interpretations in exactly the same way the victim of hypnosis may take over the suggestions implanted by the hypnotist. Additionally, this method of inquisition by drugs contains some physical danger. I myself have seen cases of thrombosis develop as a result of intravenous medication of barbiturates. Experiments with mescaline, which started 30 years ago, were suddenly fashionable again. Aldous Huxley, in his recent book, The Doors of Perception, described the artificial chemical paradise which he experienced after taking the drug known as peyote. It can stimulate all kinds of pleasant subjective symptoms, but these are, nevertheless, delusive in character. I do not want to start a clinical argument with an author I esteem, Yet, his own euphoric, ecstatic reactions to mescaline are not necessarily the same as those other people experience. 25 years ago, I myself experimented with mescaline in order to make a first-hand acquaintance with a genuine pathological thoughts. I nearly collapsed as a result. Only a few people have had the ecstatic experience as Huxley describes. Mescaline is dangerous stuff when not used under medical control. And anyway, why does Mr. Huxley want to sell artificial heavens? There is a very serious social danger in all these methods of chemical intrusion into the mind. True, they can be used as a careful aid to psychotherapy, but they can also be frightening instruments of control in the hands of men with an overwhelming drive to power. In addition, they fortify more than ever in our aspirin age the fiction that we have to use the miracle drugs in order to become free-acting agents. The propaganda for chemical elation, for artificial ecstasy and pseudo nirvanic experience contains an invitation to men to become chemical dependents and chemical dependents are weak people who can be made use of by any tyrannical political potentate the actual propaganda carried on among general practitioners urging treatment of all kinds of anxieties and mental disturbances with new drugs has the same kind of dangerous implications and that was needling for the truth from the rape of the mind by juiced mirlo md back in a minute Thank you, thank you. And now, Representative Matt Getz on the floor of the House. Gentleman from Minnesota Reserves, the gentleman from Florida is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. 
I brought a war powers resolution to the floor of this Congress to get U.S. troops out of Syria, arguing that the United States being excessively entangled in great power competition in Syria wasn't making life better for Syrians, it wasn't playing out to our benefit in the sphere of great power competition, and that it left U.S. service members and contractors as sitting ducks. And following that vote, which I lost overwhelmingly on a bipartisan fashion, sadly, there were casualties. There was the death of an American because we have now become the neighborhood crime watch of certain areas in Syria where there are oil rigs. And that's what it's all about. So I now come to the floor with this resolution to repeal a 2004 emergency vis-a-vis Syria. 2004. Now, it's supposed to be voted on by Congress every six months thereafter, but we have been derelict in our duty in doing so. And so I'm glad that today we're bringing forward a number of these emergency resolutions that have just been dormant slush funds, spending untold sums of money with no transparency as to how much is going into the Syrian emergency. But how about this rule for how about the House thinks about emergencies? Nothing's allowed to be an emergency for 20 years. Because if it were really an emergency, there probably would have been some cataclysmic event of biblical proportion before the 20 years. And if it's still an emergency 20 years later, it's a chronic condition. And the United States cannot be the world's policeman, and we cannot be the world's piggy bank. Now, if the principal argument against my resolution is that my resolution is soft on Assad... Well, the logic that undergirds that is that somehow the 2004 resolution was this great anti-Assad tool that we must have, that we must maintain to beat Assad. Well, look around, Mr. Speaker, Assad's never been stronger. So if this 2004 resolution was Assad kryptonite, it's been the worst Assad kryptonite you could ever imagine. It's malfunctioned. So I think we ought to repeal this emergency. We have sought transparency to see how much money has been going pursuant to it. We don't know the answer to that question. And to the extent that there are sanctions that we still want to maintain, whether it, it whether there are the other national emergencies that exist targeted at terrorism generally, at Russia, at Iran, the Magnitsky Act, there are all kinds of other authorities for the President, the Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of the Department of Commerce, even the DOD weighs in, state regarding sanctions regimes. So this is not a vote to lift sanctions and then just hope for the best with some pretty gnarly Syrians. In in fact, it's us standing up to do our job, and that's what we should do in repealing this 2004 resolution. I reserve. I, I- Thank you, thank you. And now, uh, Mark Levin, who I have absolutely no respect for as a... Uh, radio show host. He has the worst voice in radio. He doesn't belong on the radio. He should get off the radio as fast as he possibly can. Having said that, he is interviewing somebody I do have a little bit of respect for, and that is Leo Terrell. We're here with our buddy Leo Terrell, one of the great lawyers in the country. Leo Terrell, isn't it interesting that the media almost never put defense lawyers on TV? It's always former federal prosecutors. And then they, they look at the indictment and they say, this is insurmountable. We've never seen anything like this in our life. Oh, my God, he's going to go to prison for 1,012 years. Look at this charge. How is he going to overcome it? Don't mess with the federal government. That's the lesson. Well, I want to go through a few things with you, Mr. Attorney, so the American people understand <laughs> there's two sides here. Uh, when it comes to this, and that the president's lawyers have multiple opportunities. Among other things I mentioned last Sunday, here are 40 leaks, including grand jury leaks, investigative leaks, all the leaks that helped the federal government in their case, a motion in front of the judge immediately to order an investigation by OPR, the Office of Professional Responsibility, into the special counsel, his staff, Get his texts, get his emails, get his phone logs, because it violates the Fifth and Sixth Amendment to the Constitution due process. Am I right? Oh, you're 100% correct. And let me tell you why. 
why all these leaks are being leaked to the left wing media immediately. They are the prosecutors on these left wing shows have all the evidence because it's being leaked, Mark, from Jack Smith's office, the Department of Justice, to the media. And I'll tell you right now, that is a valid motion because these leaks are detrimental and they're trying to influence the jury pool. That would be one of the first motions I would file if I was Trump's attorney. How about a motion to dismiss the indictment on the Presidential Records Act? The PRA governs the relationship former presidents have with the archives, not the Espionage Act. And let's get this thing set up. Let's get the constitutional and statutory discussion going now. Let's cite the Obama judge in the Clinton uh, Judicial Watch case where he puts classified information in his socks drawer. Let's get that going and let's get that resolved. What about that motion? Uh, Game over. That is, to me, the most important first motion President Trump legal team can file. Look, the President Records Act exonerates President Trump. Period. And there is cases that are on file to show that support. What can the prosecution use in response? President Trump had the absolute right to declassify any and all documents in his custody, control, and possession. There has been no response to that by the prosecution. I'll tell you why. Because they don't have one, Mark. They are going after this man for one sole reason. Everyone knows it. The leading Republican candidate, in my opinion, the next president of this country, is trying to be derailed by the prosecution, by Joe Biden, by Merrick Garland, by Christopher Wray, and the Democratic machine. Oh, I forgot. And the left-wing media. They are in trouble. They cannot beat him at the polls, but they want to tie him up in the legal system. The Presidential Record Act, back to the call of your question, in my opinion, is an outright dismissal of these frivolous charges against Donald J. Trump. And that was uh, Mark Levin interviewing uh, Leo Terrell. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now a little bit of uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Okay, so a question that I've been thinking about for a long time. Okay, you've been saying that education is the way out of poverty. And yes. so how do you plan to improve the quality of education un, un, in underprivileged communities and ensure that children have um, a way out um, no matter the social economic background? Yeah, I mean, we, people should not be enslaved by the zip code that they're born in. And I use that word literally. I think this is... I think this is the civil rights issue of our time, really. You talk about silly race-based quota systems on the back end. The problem starts in early childhood education where people are literally trapped in the zip code where they're born. That's how you get generational systemic inequality. And yet the irony is the very people who favor the back end band-aids are the ones who are opposed to reform on the front end. So how do we do it? We need to rethink the educational system to be based upon who would have ever thought the achievement of students rather okay. than on providing employment perks to the bureaucrats, including those who run the teachers unions that hold those students captive. So I'm going to share a, an interesting fact with you. There is an inverse correlation. OK, so that doesn't just mean there isn't a good enough correlation. There's literally an inverse correlation. It's the opposite. That is to say that the more you spend per student in the public schools, Literally, the less well those students are actually performing. Wow. That should be my boggling. So is. on a per-student basis in certain cities in this country where they're spending $35,000, $40,000 per student per year in places like the inner cities of Philadelphia or Chicago, those schools are delivering worse results than charter schools or private schools or even other public schools that are spending fifteen dollars to $20,000 per student per month. What? So it, it's crazy. staggering. So part of my vision here is, let me give you my policy. I'm going to shut down the U.S. Department of Education. That's the head of the snake the, at the federal government level. Okay. Wow. Give that money back to the people that allow parents to be able to choose where they send their kids to school, to be able to take them out of those public schools that are failing and move them to private schools or charter schools, even if it's outside their district, because they have enough money, yes, money in the parents' pockets to actually do it. And then I go one step further with this one. 
I think that this is the cherry on top, but it's a big one. It's a way of starving the bureaucracy of the teachers' unions at the state level. So let's say a parent takes their kid out of one of those schools that is spending $40,000 per student per year and moving to one that spends $20,000 per student per year. I think literally that family should get half the difference. So $40,000 okay. minus $20,000 is $20,000. I think that family should be able to get the $10,000 difference that literally goes into the kid's account. And so we've done some modeling on this in terms of if you assume normal investment returns, it starts in kindergarten. By the time they get to 12th grade, what does that add up to? We're talking about a two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $250,000, under some assumptions, a $300,000 graduation gift waiting for that kid wow, when they graduate a, from high school. I like That's that. a pretty good graduation gift. That that is, that's that's amazing. amazing. That is insane. Yeah. Okay. So that was Vivek. Ramaswamy, let me see. Okay, so uh, let me try that again. I'm, wondering, I'm trying to figure out where. If, I must be some sort of a podcast, but I can't tell. Uh, let me see. No, doesn't say. So I'm guessing it's a podcast that he was being interviewed on. But it was Vivek Ramaswamy. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, a uh, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy by himself about the invisible hand behind Mexican drug cartels. So here's the thing about the fentanyl crisis in the United States. It is completely supply-side driven. What does that mean? It's not just the fact that people have this raging demand for fentanyl all of a sudden. It started when we started to see flooding of fentanyl across our southern border. So what's going on there? The thing that's going on is that China is effectively waging a modern opium war on the United States. They had their experience of that a long time ago. They're now using that same tactic against the U.S., where China is providing raw materials at really inexpensive prices, low prices, to Mexican drug cartels. Well, if you're the Mexican drug cartels, that just expanded your profit margin because now your inputs to production, to synthetic production of fentanyl, just went down by a lot. That allows you to profit more if you're able to sell more. That then created the incentive for them to push more fentanyl across the southern border, including through their networks that are now, by the way, in the United States, and not only causing violence directly in the United States, but supplying fentanyl across the country, contributing to over 100,000 deaths per year due to fentanyl in the United States. That's over 50 times the number of people who died on the day of 9-11. So we have to wake up to that reality. What do we do about it? If it's a supply side problem, you deal with the supply problem. In fact, there are even good evidence now, there's books being written about it, of Chinese actors in Mexico itself helping to create, even synthetically create that fentanyl that cartels are using to send across the southern border. What do we need? We need a U.S. president willing to use military force to annihilate those cartels. If we can use our military to take out ISIS or something, somebody else somewhere across the world, we can do it to the drug cartels south of our own border. We can call Mexico, say, look, we're going to aid you in doing this for a fraction of what we spent in Ukraine. But if the Mexican president isn't willing to carry it out, the U.S. needs to be willing to do it on our own. And that is how we solve the fentanyl crisis, as opposed to just being a passive bystander, which I refuse to do as U.S. president. So here's the thing about the fentanyl. And that was Vivek Ramaswamy about the drug cartels. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Philosophy Who Needs It by Ayn Rand. You have undoubtedly heard me being accused of exaggeration. I shall now read to you an excerpt from the paper of a professor published by an alumni faculty seminar of a prominent university. Perhaps in the future, reason will cease to be important. Perhaps for guidance in time of trouble, people will turn not to human thought, but to the human capacity for suffering. Not the universities with their thinkers, but the places and people in distress, the inmates of asylums and concentration camps, the helpless decision-makers in bureaucracy, and the helpless soldiers in foxholes. These will be the ones to lighten man's way, 
to refashion his knowledge of disaster into something creative. We may be entering a new age. Our heroes may not be intellectual giants like Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein, but victims like Anne Frank, who will show us a greater miracle than thought. They will teach us how to endure, how to create good in the midst of evil, and how to nurture love in the presence of death. Should this happen, however, the university will still have its place. Even the intellectual man can be an example of creative suffering. Observe that we are not to question the helpless decision makers in bureaucracy. We are not to discover that they are the cause of the concentration camps, of the foxholes, and of victims like Anne Frank. We are not to help such victims. We are merely to feel suffering, and to learn to suffer some more. We can't help it. The helpless bureaucrats can't help it. Nobody can help it. The inmates of asylums will guide us, not intellectual giants. Suffering is the supreme value, not reason. This, ladies and gentlemen, is cultural bankruptcy. Since challenge is your slogan, I will say that if you are looking for a challenge, you are facing the greatest one in history. A moral revolution is the most difficult, the most demanding. The most radical form of rebellion, but that is the task to be done today. If you choose to accept it, when I say radical, I mean it in its literal and reputable sense. Fundamental. Civilization does not have to perish. The brutes are winning only by default. But in order to fight them to the finish and with full rectitude, it is the altruist morality that you have to reject. Now, if you want to know what my philosophy, objectivism, offers you, I will give you a brief indication. I will not attempt in one lecture to present my whole philosophy. I will merely indicate to you what I mean by a rational morality of self-interest, what I mean by the opposite of altruism, what kind of morality is possible to man, and why. I will preface it by reminding you that most philosophers, especially most of them today, have always claimed that morality is outside the province of reason, that no rational morality can be defined, and that man has no practical need of morality. Morality, they claim, is not a necessity of man's existence, but only some sort of mystical luxury or arbitrary social whim. In fact, they claim. Nobody can prove why we should be moral at all. In reason, they claim, there's no reason to be moral. I cannot summarize for you the essence and the base of my morality any better than I did in Atlas Shrugged. So, rather than attempt to paraphrase it, I will read to you the passages from Atlas Shrugged, which pertain to the nature, the base, and the proof of my morality. Man's mind is his basic tool of survival. Life is given to him; survival is not. His body is given to him; its sustenance is not. His mind is given to him; its content is not. To remain alive, he must act, and before he can act, he must know the nature and purpose of his action. He cannot obtain his food without a knowledge of food, and of the way to obtain it. He cannot dig a ditch. Or build a cyclotron, without a knowledge of his aim, and of the means to achieve it. To remain alive, he must think. But to think is an act of choice. The key to what you so recklessly call human nature, the open secret you live with yet dread to name, is the fact that man is a being of volitional consciousness. Reason does not work automatically. Thinking is not a mechanical process. The connections of logic are not made by instinct. The function of your stomach, lungs, or heart is automatic. The function of your mind is not. In any hour and issue of your life, you are free to think or to evade that effort. But you are not free to escape from your nature, from the fact that reason is your means of survival. So that for you, who are a human being, the question. 
To be or not to be is the question, to think or not to think. A being of volitional consciousness has no automatic course of behavior. He needs a code of values to guide his actions. Value is that which one acts to gain and keep. Virtue is the action by which one gains and keeps it. Value presupposes an answer to the question. A value to whom and for what? Value presupposes a standard, a purpose, and the necessity of action in the face of an alternative. Where there are no alternatives, no values are possible. There is only one fundamental alternative in the universe, existence or non-existence, and it pertains to a single class of entities, to living organisms. The existence of inanimate matter is unconditional. The existence of life is not. It depends on a specific course of action. Matter is indestructible. It changes its form, but it cannot cease to exist. It is only a living organism that faces a constant alternative, the issue of life or death. Life is a process of self-sustaining and self-generated action. If an organism fails in that action, it dies. Its chemical elements remain, but its life goes out of existence. It is only the concept of life that makes the concept of value possible. It is only to a living entity that things can be good or evil. A plant must feed itself in order to live. The sunlight, the water, the chemicals it needs are the values its nature has set it to pursue. Its life is the standard of value directing its actions. But a plant has no choice of action. There are alternatives in the conditions it encounters, but there is no alternative in its function. It acts automatically to further its life. It cannot act for its own destruction. An animal is equipped for sustaining its life. Its senses provide it with an automatic code of action, an automatic knowledge of what is good for it or evil. It has no power to extend its knowledge or to evade it. In conditions where its knowledge proves inadequate, it dies. But so long as it lives, it acts on its knowledge. With automatic safety and no power of choice, it is unable to ignore its own good, unable to decide to choose the evil and to act as its own destroyer. Man has no automatic code of survival. His particular distinction from all other living species is the necessity to act in the face of alternatives by means of volitional choice. He has no automatic knowledge of what is good for him or evil, what values his life depends on, what course of action it requires. Are you prattling about an instinct of self-preservation? An instinct of self-preservation is precisely what man does not possess. An instinct is an unerring and automatic form of knowledge. A desire is not an instinct. A desire to live does not give you the knowledge required for living. And even man's desire to live is not automatic. Your secret evil today is that that is the desire you do not hold. Your fear of death is not a love for life and will not give you the knowledge needed to keep it. Man must obtain his knowledge and choose his actions by a process of thinking, which nature will not force him to perform. Man has the power to act as his own destroyer, and that is the way he has acted through most of his history. Man has been called a rational being, but rationality is a matter of choice. And the alternative his nature offers him is rational being or suicidal animal. Man has to be man by choice. He has to hold his life as a value by choice. He has to learn to sustain it by choice. He has to discover the values it requires and practice his virtues by choice. A code of values accepted by choice is a code of morality. Whoever you are, you who are hearing me now, I am speaking to whatever living remnant is left uncorrupted within you, to the remnant of the human, to your mind, and I say, there is a morality of reason, a morality proper to man, and man's life is its standard of value. 
All that which is proper to the life of a rational being is the good. All that which destroys it is evil. Man's life, as required by his nature, is not the life of a mindless brute, of a looting thug, or a mooching mystic, but the life of a thinking being, not life by means of force or fraud, but life by means of achievement, not survival at any price, since there's only one price that pays for man's survival, reason. Man's life is the standard of morality, but your own life is its purpose. If existence on earth is your goal, you must choose your actions and values by the standard of that which is proper to man, for the purpose of preserving, fulfilling, and enjoying the irreplaceable value which is your life. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what objectivism offers you. And when you make your choice, I would like you to remember that the only alternative to it is communist slavery. The middle of the road is like an unstable radioactive element that can last only so long, and its time is running out. There is no more chance for a middle of the road. The issue will be decided not in the middle, but between the two consistent extremes. It's objectivism or communism. It's a rational morality based on man's right to exist, or altruism, which means slave labor camps under the rule of such masters as you might have seen on the screens of your TV last year. If that is what you prefer, the choice is yours. But don't make that choice blindly. You, the young generation, have been betrayed in the most dreadful way by your elders, by those liberals of the 30s who armed Soviet Russia and destroyed the last remnants of American capitalism. All that they have to offer you now is foxholes, or the kind of attitude expressed in the quotation on creative suffering that I read to you. This is all that you will hear on any side. Give up before you have started. Give up before you have tried. And to make sure that you give up, they do not even let you know what the 19th century was. I hope this may not be fully true here, but I have met too many young people in universities who have no clear idea, not even in the most primitive terms, of what capitalism really is. They do not let you know what the theory of capitalism is, nor how it worked in practice, nor what was its actual history. Don't give up too easily. Don't sell out your life. If you make an effort to inquire on your own, you will find that it is not necessary to give up and that the allegedly powerful monster now threatening us will run like a rat at the first sign of a human step. It is not physical danger that threatens you, and it is not military considerations that make our so-called intellectual leaders tell you that we are doomed. That is merely their rationalization. The real danger is that communism is an enemy whom they do not dare to fight on moral grounds, and it can be fought only on moral grounds. This, then, is the choice. Think it over. Consider the subject. Check your premises. Check past history and find out whether it is true that men can never be free. It isn't true, because they have been. Find out what made it possible. See for yourself. And then, if you are convinced, rationally convinced, then let us save the world together. We still have time. To quote Galt once more, such is the choice before you. Let your mind... And your love of existence decide. And that was part four of chapter seven of Philosophy Who Needs It by Ayn Rand. Back in a minute.
Thank you, thank you. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all of the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. And until next time, be honest, be smart, be beautiful, and remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.